Hi, it's Dennis Daly. Over the years, I interviewed an awful lot of people, and I was lucky that I saved a lot of those interviews, but others I thought were lost. Now I found a bunch of them, and also some interviews that were only presented in short form here on YouTube. And one year I had the opportunity to go to Scotland and stay in the fantastic Glen Eagles Hotel. You'll be hearing a lot during this show of various aspects of all the fun you can have in one of those tucked away resorts. Tony Herdman greeted me at the front desk and I asked him the history of Glen Eagles. It was built by the Caledonia Railway Company and started in 1913. And it was built specifically to attract the travelling public, which in those days were the wealthy. And the idea of Donald Matheson, who was then the managing director of the Caledonian Railway Company, was to build a Highland Palace based around golf, with the very good idea of having them travel on his railway line, stay in his hotel, and play on his golf course. And that's as it has been. It's been the Railway Hotel. It was then taken over by LMS, but in fact the work on the hotel took a long time to complete because the First World War intervened. And it lay, believe it or not, without a roof on this hotel, just, a, just the basic walls with the Scottish weather getting in and the wildlife pigeons for nine years uh, until it started being rebuilt again in 1922. The golf course has opened in 1920, but the hotel itself opened in 1924. And it instantly achieved a sort of a recognition amongst the wealthy and amongst the socialites of the time as being somewhere to be seen. And so in the 1920s and 30s, this was very much the place to come and play golf. And its reputation has never really sort of run down since then. During the Second World War, it was a military hospital. And after the war, it, the railway companies were nationalized, and uh, it became British Transport Hotels right up to 1982. Now, you ask, is it a year round? Believe it or not, right up to 1982, this hotel used to close for the winter. It closed from, Mar from August, sorry, I'm so sorry, October through March, uh, because golf was the only thing people could do here. But when Maggie Thatcher's first privatization occurred, which was the privatization of the British Transport Hotels, this and the others you've named in Scotland, one of which is also the Turnbury Hotel, uh, the other four, the other three, there were four great railway hotels in Scotland, were all privatized and taken into private ownership. This hotel was bought by an Edinburgh consortium, which then became, was bought by Bells, then United Distillers, and now Guinness. So Guinness are the owners. We have a, a fellow in, in the United States, Henry Flagler, who uh, was a great railroad builder, but his way of tying the two together was to build hotels. We have the popularity of Florida, the Miami Beach area. All of that was the result of his building hotels down there and then building a railroad to get there. Oh, well, this, <coughs> well, this was, uh, uh, the railroad was already here, but the people weren't coming to Scotland because there really wasn't anywhere for them to stay in Scotland. Golf was very much the up-and-coming thing at the time in, in the Edwardian days. Uh, and the wealthy, remember, these are really the wealthy who travelled, um, weren't going to stay in basic little hotels around the place. They wanted somewhere rather start to stay. And this was the place that was built for them. So, Tony, what is it like here? We're coming up on fall. Uh, just as in the States, the weather can be very changeable this time of year. Uh, I, I can imagine that, that not only are there gorgeous winter activities, but this must be beautifully decorated at Christmas time. Oh, yeah. So Christmas is a wonderful season. But actually, we deliberately don't fill the hotel at Christmas because we want people to have space to really enjoy themselves. Hogmanay, however, now that's a different thing. We are fully booked out for Hogmanay, even for the year 2000, as you would imagine. Now, Hogmanay is uh, the Scottish New Year. It's a very much more important celebration than Christmas. Believe it or not, the Scots didn't celebrate Christmas until the turn of the century. Christmas was just a non-event um, in, in terms of public holidays. Hogmanay, or the New Year and New Year's Day, uh, have always been the highlight of the, of the year for the Scots. Well, now, suppose a person has the wherewithal to get here. I have yet to take the tour. What am I going to see today? 
Right. Well, since 1982, a vast amount of money has been put in by Guinness into this hotel to make it into a year-round, not just golf hotel. We're going out to see the shooting in the Jackie Stewart Shooting School. Now, Jackie Stewart, many people know, is a world champion racing driver, but actually he is also, or was, a world champion clay pigeon skeet shooter. And he founded this, and it is still his franchise to the hotel. We're also going to see falconry, a thing which you can't do in many other places. In fact, it's almost unique in this country. It's the only place that you, as a private individual with no training, no background at all, can fly a bird and you can actually work a bird and hunt a bird um, and it's enormously popular. You can see off-road driving up in the highlands, they take you, uh, I, th I think the, the expression is no tarmac. <laughs> <laughs> keep clear of the tarmac and they take you in the most astonishing places. I must say this gently and I do not mean this as a criticism some of the single lane country roads I've been on to me are almost off-road driving anyway <laughs> I've had some delightful experiences with sheep for example posts I've come too close to it uh, the, 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 the highlands and the hills here are just absolutely phenomenal well, I think on this off-road driving, the main road is a riverbed. I mean, that's... Uh, but for some people, that's nothing special. But, of course, a lot of our guests come from towns, and they never get the opportunity to drive these vehicles in terrain, which, frankly, they just never see. But the other thing we've also got is a question, probably one of the foremost equestrian centres in Europe, um, uh, and a uh, huge facility. <clears throat> it's called the Mark Phillips Riding School. He, of course, was the husband of Princess Anne, um, but remains one of the uh, top riders and horsemen in this country. Uh, it is now part of the hotel as opposed to being a franchise that's been taken back in again. Uh, we've got uh, one of the, in the golf terms, we've got a, a golf academy which is again brand new, just being uh, in the last year opened and some of the, form of the best facilities in the world there. And of course we've actually now got three 18-hole championship courses here. The Monarchs, which has been designed by Jack Nicklaus and was only opened five years ago. The Queens, Kings and Queens, which are the old traditional courses here, which have got a reputation, I mean, I almost have to say second to none in the world, particularly the Kings. And there's another smaller course, an eight, uh, nine hole par three course. We've got pitch and putts. We've got endless numbers of uh, um, putting greens. We've got uh, a fantastic swimming pool, which itself is being doubled in size. Another swimming pool going in, uh, a new restaurant, new workout facilities, all this being uh, built at the moment. So it's just never ending here. We are an all year round resort, and uh, people come to do whatever they wish to do. Well, let's go. <laughs> All right, lovely. And go we did all around beautiful Glen Eagles. There were two wonderful experiences I had at Glen Eagles that I need to share with you. I did not bring my tape recorder along because, well, I did not want to try to hold a tape recorder, a microphone, and a hawk at the same time. And the other involved skeet shooting, shooting clay pigeons, which can be very, very noisy. But I do want to share those two experiences with you. I have never been a gun fancier. As a matter of fact, guns scare me to death. But when the uh, Glen Eagles Hotel and Resort afforded me the opportunity to try my hand at skeet shooting, I decided, well, why not? I thought I would be absolutely terrible at it. But I did pretty well, both the ones that go up in the air and the ones that roll along the ground. I had the most wonderful instructor who took time to tell me all about the fine art of shooting, who uh, showed me that even though I do look out of both eyes, I look out of my right eye more than my left, uh, more than my left, so I don't need to close my left eye when I shoot. It was great fun. You have to wear uh, protective gear to keep the sound out of your ears, but I thought that would be a little too noisy for you. But it was my first hand at uh, first time at shooting clay pigeons, and I wasn't too bad at it after I got the, the hang of it, largely because of the wonderful instruction I got. But the highlight of my stay at Glen Eagles had to be falconry. This is where they take you out with a hawk, or a falcon if you're very, very much into this, and the darn thing flies. You look at a perch and you swing your arm back and let it go, and there it goes, up into the tree or onto the perch, and then you signal, and it comes back. And they only weigh about two pounds, and they are beautiful, gorgeous animals. And again, a great instructor 
at Glen Eagle showing me how to do this. I wasn't afraid. I thought I would be. You put on a leather glove and the bird comes back and it just kind of sits there and waits for you to feed it. Then you do a wonderful thing where you walk through the woods and you let the hawk go and it follows you like a dog. It'll stop in a tree and then fly on to someplace else and finally when you get ready for it to come back the instructor puts a little piece of meat or food uh, on the top of your wrist and the hawk comes back. There are very few places in the world where you can do that and Glen Eagles in Scotland is one of them and my special thanks to them I will never forget the experience of having my own hawk fly off and come back. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'd never heard Gaelic before. I knew the Scottish spoke a peculiar form of English, but this isn't English, is it? But the gentle Scottish people have a wonderful accent, and you notice it when you ask a local for directions. Turn right, up, right over, down the hill. Now, just at the bottom of the hill, the main road views uh, to the, the wonderful, wonderful accent of the Scots. They are a frugal, wonderful people, but more than that, they are incredibly hospitable. And also, they are incredibly ingenious. Many, many years ago, when I was about 10 years old, I decided I wanted to be an engineer and design highways and bridges and tunnels, and I became enamored of an incredible railroad bridge over the Firth of Forth. Now, Firth, F-I-R-T-H, is the Scottish word for inlet or estuary, and Forth is not a number in this case. It's the name of a place. There had been a railroad bridge collapse. And when it came time to build this bridge in the late 1800s, they overbuilt it. It looks like something out of Star Wars, but it is indeed a monumental engineering feat. Using the Glen Eagles Hotel and Resort as a kind of a place to use as my headquarters, I was able to drive around a lot of Scotland in my Avis rental car on the left side of the road. And when I got into Edinburgh, I looked at the map and I said, my golly, look at this. The bridge is right here. So I went to the bridge and absolutely relived my childhood, looking up at that beautiful, beautiful structure. Found that there was a museum there. And a nice lady named Denise Edwards told me all about the bridge's history, the old railroad bridge, and the new highway bridge beside it, which is itself an engineering feat. It's a symbol that a lot of people are aware of, and uh, in many ways is a national symbol for Scotland. Um, it's a very Im impressive structure. It was built in seven years, um, in the, starting in the 1880s, and it was built as a more efficient form of transport for crossing the Firth of the Forth. Uh, prior to that, the only means of people getting from South Queen's Ferry over into Fife and of course back again was by ferry and that could be very um, precarious because um, obviously the run would depend on the weather, the winds and the, the tides and so forth. So with the new railway bridge both uh, people and goods could be transported very effectively, efficiently and economically from one part of Scotland to the other. Is the north of here what is called the Highlands, or are we into the Highlands at this point? No, we're, we're certainly not into the Highlands. This would be uh, regarded as the Lowlands here. Um, that's in, in Lothian, uh, Edinburgh South, Queen's Ferry. And then, of course, you come to the Kingdom of Fife. Uh, traditionally, the Trossachs near Stirling are considered to be the beginning of the Highlands. I'm looking in this case at some of the memorabilia from the building of the bridge. There are several rivets here. And a gentleman at a, at a service station told me that when they refurbished the bridge, they sold some of the old rivets as memorabilia, that he has one at home on his mantle. Well, um, I, I wasn't aware of that, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me. We have quite a number of rivets in the collection. In fact, they were one of the remarkable features that went into the building of the bridge. I believe there were about seven million of them that went into <laughs> the building of the original structure. And, of course, um, the machine that was, a uh, uh, new machine was invented in order to do the riveting for the bridge, which was invented by Sir William Arrell. Um, the, one of the engineers, oh, the main engineer for the bridge. Well, Denise, you have an enormous amount of photographs here in the museum, and I, I must 
put this in perspective, this is South Queen's Ferry, is that this correct? Is south, it's on the Edinburgh this is side. South Queen's Ferry, yes, on, on the Edinburgh side. Uh, yes, the, so. the wonderful main street here is cobblestone. It's one lane in some places, and, and then it makes me forget I have to drive on the left mm. when, I, when I exit that area. Yeah, well, the, t the town of South Queen's Ferry is very, very interesting in itself, and in, in fact, it's been designated an area of outstanding architectural interest, with many of its buildings being listed. You have some great photographs of this magnificent bridge under completion. You said it took seven years. It is so intricate. In a way, it, it seems seven years is too short a time to have finished it. It was a, a, a magnificent achievement, and, and building went on um, for every day of the week, of, except, of course, Sundays. Um, but, but yes, it's a magnificent feat of, of Scottish engineering, and um, an absolute wonder to look at, very architectonic, and um, almost seeing it being built and how it was built, almost space-age-ish, I, I think. <laughs> Denise, beside the, uh, the Firth of Forth Railroad Bridge and down some distance is, is a magnificent suspension bridge for highway use, which I think d dates from the 1960s. That replaced, I would presume, a very busy ferry here. After all, the city is called Queen's Ferry. Yes, that, that's certainly true. And from the windows of the museum here, you, you have a magnificent view across the Forth with, on your right, the Forth Railway Bridge, and on your left, the very elegant Forth Road Bridge. The Forth Road Bridge was completed in 1964, and, um, of course, the completion of the road bridge meant the the old ferry service, which had been going on, well, since time immemorial, really, um, had, um, had to be closed down because it was no longer in use. And in fact, the frequency in traffic, of course, has been, so, has been such that it's now proposed that um, a third bridge spans the fourth at some time in the future. If you go to Glen Eagles, you also have to go to St. Andrews, and it's not a far drive. St. Andrews, of course, the birthplace of golf. I had a very long talk with the uh, people at the uh, Old Course Hotel, and they assigned me a personable fellow named Willie to drive me around. St. Andrews is a college town as well as a golf mecca. It is the site of some wonderful historic ruins, and uh, Willie, the chauffeur, told me that some very, very famous people go through there every year. Yes, so oh yes, you get the film stars coming in for a bit private round, you know. Most of the time, I think they try and the, the hotel tries to keep it low key. Obviously, for the, the privacy of the guest, I think, which is a thing that's of paramount importance. Because these people, they come here and they like to have some, some time to themselves, you know. And I, I think if everybody knew they were coming, they would be surrounded with people but oh yes we've had some quite famous people here I've, I've driven uh, Robocop, Peter Weller remember him, he done the film Robocop he, he's been here, Don Johnson's been here, Miami Vice and he's sat in that seat <laughs> and all, all the famous golfers of course um, most of them have been in the car and you know, I think many Americans are not aware, and I was not really until I traveled on the continent uh, and in the UK last year, as to how much of the US culture uh, has come here. I mean, all of our TV shows. I was watching Mission Impossible in the hotel the other night. We, some, we sometimes forget uh, the, the fact that you are very much aware of all of our programming almost, who our stars are. That's right. There's, I mean, there's as many American programs on the television over here as there is uh, uh, British programs. Willie, this is such a, a, a beautiful part of the world here, Scotland. Uh, the weather can be very changeable uh, this time of year. Some of this architecture goes back four or five centuries before the uh, uh, certainly Columbus discovered, if, if indeed he did, America. What is it like to work here? to see the awe on people's faces when they when they see all of this for the first time? Well, I think everybody reacts differently to it, really. I mean, when you consider that uh, the age of the cathedral ruins that we're looking at now, and they talk about something old in America being only 200 years old, there's just such a vast difference. And, and people, a lot of people, especially our American guests, just can't believe that things that they're seeing are as old as they are. 
I mean, uh, when we do the tours, we often go into the highlands and we take them across the Tier Road Bridge and we point out the Tier Railway Bridge and tell them the how the first bridge collapsed in, in, in 1879. And then in the other direction, we go over the Fourth Road Bridge and point out the Fourth Railway Bridge, um, which was opened in 1888, 1890, sorry and which was in fact the first bridge in the world to be built from steel and they, they're quite amazed actually that things are as old and look still so good here yet, you know. They... I know when I was in Edinburgh they were refurbishing the, uh, that beautiful bridge over the, uh, the Firth of Forth there. It's, a, it's, it, it's impossible to describe that bridge to someone without them seeing it. I mean it's the That's most right. magnificent bridge I've ever seen. Oh yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lovely bridge. It's known as the eighth wonder of the world, I think, actually. But um, as I said, it was it's the f first bridge in the world to be built from steel. Do you play golf yourself? Well, I must make a big confession here. No, I don't. But you've certainly seen enough of it. Oh yes, I see, as, as the chauffeur here, I see quite enough and hear quite enough, actually, without uh, playing the game as well. I must admit, my colleague's a very good golfer. Quite often, actually, we get jobs with the guests, maybe going away on a full day tour. Uh, Bill will maybe be go, go on a full day tour and I'll get a job to go to some golf course quite a distance away from St Andrews, for example, Dornach. I mean, we go to all the golf courses in Scotland with guests, and if that happens, what we do is we swap them around. Uh, I go away on the tour, and Bill goes on the golf, the golf item, because he's a very good golfer, and he takes his clubs with him and sometimes goes round with the guests and keeps them right. If not, he'll walk round with them, you know, and keep them right in the courses, because he has a good idea of all the courses that we take guests to. Yeah. Sometimes I feel a little bit guilty doing this program because I often get put at the head of the line like when the Indiana Jones ride premiered at Disneyland and you and I got to go to the front of the line and ride it. Steve from the Old Course Hotel at St. Andrews was able to arrange for me to play golf on, well, to play one hole, to drop a ball in the hole. Actually, to have my picture taken, trying to tee off at the first hole at St. Andrews, which, unlike any other place in the world, is a very, very special mecca for just about everyone who's ever tried to hit a golf ball. Well, I think you're absolutely right. Um, this is the old, oldest golf course in the world. People have played golf here for 500 years. I understand here, and if we can turn around, it's not good radio to say this, but we, we are looking now at the North Sea, and there is mm -hmm. a, a beautiful beach here, which I understand played a part in a very memorable motion picture. Yes, that was the beach that appeared at the beginning of the film Chariots of Fire and they filmed the athletes uh, at around 1911, 1912 Olympics running along that beach. So uh, it's, it is very proximate to the sea. What I was going to say is that maybe the deal with the stick you were talking about is they tell me the winds can be so heavy here, maybe it kept knocking the sticks over. <laughs> <laughs> That's very possible. That's very possible. You, I take it, have golfers who come here from, from around the world uh, to play or to be here at St. Andrews, which is, is um, even though we may think of it as being very exclusive, is a, is a municipal golf course. Yes, in fact, there are five golf courses. As we look down from the first tee of the, the old course, we're actually looking across five links courses, all of which are municipal courses. There is the old course, there is the new course, which is in fact well over 100 years old. There's the Jubilee, which celebrates its centenary this year. Uh, the Eden and the Strathium course also. Well, now the old golf course, the original one, the mm -hmm. one where legend has it golf began, dates from when? Uh, no one knows, but the first record of golf on the old course is in the early 1400s. Did they have scorecards back then? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. It was match play. Man against man, and uh, the least number of shots won. What type of tourist do you see here? I would take it, uh, it, it beggars the fact you have to have a wee bit of money to, to come here, but I would presume you see people who are not only very, very good golfers, professionals, but also hackers come here. Yes, it's really open to everybody. And in addition to the uh, five courses I mentioned, there's a special nine-hole course for children and beginners right here on the links and <clears throat> it's not really an exclusive it's not really an exclusive sport here in Scotland 
Uh, children can play on the course for two pounds seventy-five pence, which I guess is under five dollars. Uh, there's a broad range of green fees on the different courses, and you can buy an annual ticket if you're living in the town for ninety pounds. Well, we couldn't go to Scotland without stopping by Loch Ness. I camped out beside Loch Ness for the better part of an afternoon and didn't see any monsters except a few American tourists there. I stopped by the museum at Loch Ness and was given the tour, and I asked the curator of the museum about that classic photo of Nessie, the Loch Ness monster, coming up out of Loch Ness, that picture we see so often in books and magazines. Sadly, that's been um, defunct for a couple of years. Oh, I hate to hear that. It's terrible because we all we all pinned our hopes on it. We loved it. Everybody, everybody recognizes that particular picture. It was taken in 1934 by a surgeon in the, in the British Army. Um, and he sat on it for quite a long time. Uh, it was then put out to the public domain. Um, and everybody regarded that as about the the most yeah, the author, definitive authentic. picture. Yes, yes, the definitive picture. It wasn't until recent years that, oh, long after his death, obviously, um, that his friend who was with him, one Christian Sperling, was investigated by some people that knew about the monster, um, and confessed that yes, it was a hoax. It was a hoax. He he asked that it wasn't made public until after his death. And he died at the age of 90 in 1995. Wow. Well, now, obviously, we're outside the museum here, and listeners can tell there's a great deal of traffic. This highway, which is the A82 up to Inverness, is, is a very heavily traveled road, although by U.S. standards rather narrow and curvy. I would presume you get an awful lot of visitors here. Oh, we do. Um, upwards of 250,000 people come into the site each year. Uh, we stay open all the year round, obviously, and uh, it, it has become one of Scotland's leading visitor attractions. Well, let's get back to that photo from the 30s again. Was that photo not the main reason why a lot of people over the years have been so fascinated? And then couple that with the research that's been done today. Do you think there's something out there? Oh, definitely. No question. Not an enormous movie-type monster. I have never, ever believed in one single movie-type monster. But a colony of large animals. Uh, we all know that there are very large eels um, in Loch Ness. Very large eels. And I feel that my own personal feeling that is, it is eel-like. But the, the enormous movie-type monster has just grown over the years, I'm afraid. And by def defunking um, the surgeon's picture, it has, in fact, cleared away some of the dead wood because there's never, ever been a sighting like that before or since. But there have been sightings of something or some things. Oh, yes, yes. I, I get between three and five people a year that want to talk about what they've seen. Now that it's no longer a hoaxy jokesy subject that they realize that we do take it seriously, they're not frightened of, of talking. Loch Ness can deceive many people's eyes, it can it's deceive my own, um, but people do like to talk about what they've seen and very often I can't even give them an answer as to what they have seen. Well I notice just driving here during the daytime, the way the sun plays off the lake, that you go through the trees, that it, it's an easy place for optical illusions to be created in a way. It's so shadowy here. Very, very. And being a relatively narrow channel of water, um, it, it's affected by the weather, by the wind, by wave formations. Uh, two boats can pass each other and be gone for hours, and yet still the wake is slapping backwards and forwards, changing in size, volume. Oh yes, when I, when I first arrived in Drumna Drocket, I was watching monsters coming out of every wavelet. <laughs> <laughs> Betty, a couple more questions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm I don't mean this chauvinistically, but I, I'm happy you do not have a thick Scottish accent because to the American ear, the Scottish accent is probably the most difficult to understand. I'm a bit of a mess, actually. <laughs> um, I, I, I actually came from London 25, 26 years ago now. I was married to an Irish South African at that time. He sadly died while we were up here. Uh, and I'm now married to a Scot, so hence the name MacDougall, which is one of the very old Scottish names. But no... I'm not a Scot, I'm actually a Londoner, but this is my home and it has been for about half my life. 30 seconds, what, what is it like to work here in this old building dating from 1882, castle-like building if you will, to be involved in something that 
probably every child around the world knows about. It is sheer wonder. It's the most beautiful job I've ever had, quite honestly. And, and people are so nice and people are so interested. And, and they do like to talk about the monster and they do come here because they want to learn about the monster. And this building behind me, yes, it's a gorgeous old building. Sadly, it was an hotel um, which was destroyed by fire, but luckily the walls were so thick that it withstood the tremendous heat. And so we turned it into the Loch Ness Monster Exhibition and, and people recognise us all over the world. But it's a wonderful job and it's a wonderful spot. You can see for yourself the scenery is absolutely gorgeous, with or without the monster i think people would come to loch ness betty thanks a lot you're welcome benny mcdougall the curator of the museum at loch ness well back to glen eagles and i sure did a lot of driving in and out of that area put more than 400 miles on my avis rental car which is pretty daring because i'd never driven on the left side of the road before got by without too many scratches Back at Glen Eagles, they said, we want you to take a buggy ride. And they entrusted me to a young lady who treated the horses so gently and with great authority. We spent about 10 minutes putting on all the leather work, the harness and the reins. And I asked her how important it was that all of that be not too tight, not too loose. Well, if it's not right, one, you've got to check the stitching. Because if the stitching breaks, it can be very dangerous. Because even cars driving as well as riding, if a piece of harness breaks or it doesn't fit properly, you've got a rub. So everything has really got to be thought out and checked and double checked. Well, unlike getting in your car where you just get in and turn on the switch, how many minutes on average would you say it takes to do all this harnessing? Five, 10, if you do it properly? It can be, if you're very quick, you can perhaps do it in five, 10 minutes, but uh, it just really depends. If you've got to readjust, you can maybe take up to 15 minutes by the mm -hmm. time you put it on, check the everything fits properly, take the horse to the carriage, put two, then again, check everything is the correct distance and length as you put the horse to, the car to your carriage. You know, in, I just realized in one four-hour period, I will have gone from a horse and buggy to a car to a jet plane. Just <laughs> sure, yes. Um, from one horsepower to probably a car is what four horsepower more. A lot more, yeah. yes. And then to a jet plane that's sort of maybe a hundred thousand horsepower. <laughs> but it still comes back to horsepower at the end of the day. Speaking of experts, Terry Waldron was the uh, nice lady who arranged our stay at Glen Eagles. She invited me to that BBC concert. You may have heard the band warming up at the beginning of the program, recreating the sound of the 1920s when Glen Eagles first opened. I asked Terry how people who might be listening to American Montage, even in very small towns, can find out about tour packages for hotels in Europe, places such as Glen Eagles and other places where it is so much fun to go and just get away. The best way really is from talking to, going into your travel agent, um, not necessarily a travel agent that deals with, you know, the mass um, holidays and vacations, but um, a, try and find a small travel agent who can specialize in um, individual hotels, also leading hotels of the world. Um, we're a member of leading hotels of the world, and if you call them, they'll also give you all the information you need, and they can put you directly in touch with us as well. The other way to find out about Glen Eagles, actually, is on the internet. Um, we have our own website which is simply gleneagles.com um, and we're actually about to launch a new site in the next couple of weeks. Let's talk a little bit uh, more about finding out about things. Travel agents I have always thought were the, the world's great undiscovered resource. So many people tend to think they charge extra when indeed they are agents for the airlines and places such as yourself. Uh, I have found in shopping around in the past that quite often there are what are called shoulder seasons. There are, there are times to go to places when the weather may be a little less than perfect, but yet they're not charging the high rate. Uh, can you treat that issue? Yeah, we have shoulder seasons at Glen Eagles. Um, the place I would go to find out about shoulder seasons is to the tourist board, Scottish tourist board, or the British Tourist Authority. They'll be the best qualified probably to tell you about what's available and also what's going on during the shoulder seasons because the thing not to forget is that it's not that nothing happens in the shoulder season and everything's, everything closes down. For example, in Scotland this year in October there's a whiskey festival um, which is traditionally the shoulder season for Scotland. So there are other things that happen um, outside of the peaks 
season for for tourists to enjoy and for visitors to Scotland to enjoy. But Scotland, you know, not being Scottish and actually loving Scotland like I do, Scotland for me is perfect at any time of the year because each season is so different. I mean, just the walks and the scenery and um, the people and the same for Glen Eagles. I mean, you come to Glen Eagles any time of the year um, with all the facilities that that we have, um, the off-road driving, the falconry, the, the clay target shooting school and the equestrian fish and it just goes on and on but outside those facilities we're based right in the centre of Perthshire which is the gateway to the Highlands and we're an hour from Glasgow, an hour from Edinburgh, we're 40 minutes from Dundee, we're two and a half hours from Inverness so we're really ideally located to get from you know right in the centre to get to east coast, west coast and as far up as Inverness and even further north for day trips. Well, Terry, you have a very special place here, and, and thanks for your hospitality, and thanks for inviting us here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure having you. Well, it looks as though the BBC Big Band is starting its concert here at Glen Eagles, creating a sound first heard from this marvelous hotel back in 1924. <laughs> I tell you, that was some trip, especially driving on the left side of the road. But I'm glad I found that tape. I thought it was lost forever. Thanks for coming along, and join me again for more of my lost interviews right here on YouTube.